Welcome to Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. Each week, we talk with industry leaders in both marketing and entrepreneurship and business to find out all about their wins and failures in marketing. Right now, we'll hear all about their successes and wins and what's fallen flat so that you can take that knowledge and implement it. Learn from the best, from the folks who've been there and done it all, as well as people just like you. Thanks for joining us. This is Market Pulse, pros and pioneers. And welcome to this week's episode of Market Pulse Podcast, Pros and Pioneers. Uh, this week, I'm extremely excited to announce our guest for the week, uh, which is a little bit different take on some of the other guests we've had. So um, Jeff Joyce is joining us from Content at Scale. Um, he's also a podcast co-host at Humanity Unchained. And the reason Jeff qualifies for the show is not because he's director of AI right now, but because of his marketing background previously that's led him to become a director of AI. And I guess we could say it's kind of a, a hybrid market and AI position within the business, which I think gives us a really, really interesting opportunity to discuss what's going on out there in the world of AI right now, how it impacts on market and and how we can leverage AI or not to get the results that we want. Um, just before I get further into the show, um, a little announcement from our podcast sponsors, gridbank.io. Um, if you're listening to this, you know I'm all about building content at scale. Uh, sometimes you just need faceless video reels to get content out there. But the problem with a lot of footage banks is they just don't look native to social. It actually hinders your content performance. So gridbank.io. Uh, kind sponsors of our show. Uh, they're a database of endless vertical, authentic video clips, pumping out concepts, A-B test thumbnails, and creating authentic looking edits. If you're looking to get ahead on social without burning out your team, you can get 10% off your annual subscription with code Paul at the checkout, gridbank.io. Right, back to the episode. Uh, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Paul, thank you so much for having me. Super excited to be here. Amazing, yes. We we recently connected over, well, initially the podcast, but then I kind of got drawn into the world with which you guys play at content at scale. And I have to say, it's fascinating. Um, if, if anybody out there is listening to this who was playing about with AI four or five years ago, like I was with things like Jasper.ai or Jarvis.ai, as it was back then before they got wrong for uh, stealing Tony Stark's robot name. Um, You'll know that, like it was, it was an exciting time. Right, like, the possibilities were there. You could see what was coming, but then you asked it to write a long form article, and it turned into something that needed a lot of work. After you read it once, you realise that actually this doesn't quite do what we'd hoped it would do. But it was a start point, and it's been fascinating for me since then to see how it's progressed. Um, I guess before we get too stuck into AI and marketing, Jeff, um, you've got a, a fantastic fun fact for the day, which I've never even been aware of until you've you've posted it into our registration form. So do you want to kind of walk us through that? Absolutely. So if anybody knows the different type of AI tools that are out there, we have the three big players. We have ChatGPT, we have uh, Gemini from Google, and then we have Anthropics Claude. Anthropics Claude released their version three, and it seemed to be performing a little bit differently than most other AI uh, AIs out there. And what it was doing is it was showing signs of what we'd consider AGI. Now, this isn't true AGI. There's still a lot of things that need to take place in order for AGI to, to actually be presented to the market in a way that's functional. However, one of the signs of AGI is being able to, un to have like a self-awareness to itself to be able to understand when people are prompting it that it is an AI itself. So that's one aspect of an, of an AGI system. Well, during their research of Cloud3 and their testing of it, uh, they gave it a large document that was several hundred pages. And with built inside of those several hundred pages, they put a needle in the haystack is what they call it. It's a fact that is separate and completely weird from the rest of the document. So if the document was about, um, you know, testing toothpaste, for instance, um, you would look through that documentation and say, okay, this all seems coherent and it's all within each within itself. It makes sense. But they put a weird pizza topping fact in there that was like, what is the best uh, pizza toppings for a pizza? And it gave some like random ingredients like 
marshmallows or peanut butter on a pizza. And uh, Claude reviewed the document and they asked Claude, is there anything about the document that's kind of unusual? And Claude responded with, there is something in the document that is unusual. There's a random pizza topping uh, recipe inside of here that makes no sense. And I think that you guys are either playing a game on me or you're trying to see if I'm paying attention. And that is huge. That is huge for an AI system because it's able to then say that within all of this documentation, there it was something that it was definitely not supposed to be there. And I think that you're trying to play a trick on me. And that self-awareness from an AI system is very, very exciting because then we can actually see that pervade into the future with that system becoming more and more aware that it is an AI system, which is to me just the most exciting thing in the world. And what that means for in terms of like creating content or anything like that is that once it has that understanding of it is an AI system, it does a lot better with the reasoning uh, into the future of what it can do for you. So to understand that what its position is and how it can kind of learn the aspects of like how a human communicates with it to then improve its own content output. Wow. That was probably the deepest start to a short that we've had so far. So I'm like, if, if you're, if you're, <laughs> if you're a computer nerd, you're an AI nerd, then you're, you're hopelessly addicted to this episode. Um, if you're not, you, you might be curious or you may be switched off. I'm not sure. Um, hopefully we've, we've kept most of the people because like this conversation is, we're going to bring it back to marketing just now and then see how we connect the two together. But like, it is, it, there's, there's some fascinating possibilities. It's both scary and exciting at the same time. Um, cause we all kind of, I, I guess we all know that whilst, whilst we might be thinking this is exciting and doing some interesting things for us, some other nefarious parties out there, um, who probably don't have the same moral instincts that we do. So it's, it's both interesting, exciting and pretty scary at the same time to, to think that it might be possible. One more thing is that, uh, as far as like marketing goes. If you're a marketer in 2024, uh, you should absolutely be paying attention to AI. It is the most fundamental shift in marketing that has ever existed. I mean, it's disrupting every single industry. And if it's not in your tool stack, it's not the things that you do and pay attention to, you will get left behind. And it is something that is very, very dire for people to get into. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm so like such a proponent of like, you should be aiming in 2024 to replace yourself in your business with all the things that you do with AI. You should look for all the small tasks that are that you do on a daily day basis with and replicate that process with AI. So uh, if you're listening, make sure that you just pay attention to the aspects of how AI can absolutely, you can leverage AI in your business, especially if you're a marketer. Absolutely. And you're qualified to know that because of your background, Jeff. So do you want to just quickly run through how you got to where you are right now for the people at home who don't know who you are? Absolutely. So. Uh, back in the day, I started uh, working at a SEO agencies and I, that's how I kind of got my start. I was, uh, writing blog posts and I was doing social media content. But even before that, I, when MySpace was around, um, I was also doing social media marketing then. And so I really created content and, um, I would design like MySpace pages for bands and metal bands and all this stuff. And then that rapidly developed into, um, like really in-depth understanding and, uh, work in S the SEO space. But then I created a video agency, which is very similar to I believe what you do, Paul, uh, which I was repurposing content and I was uh, doing very, very well with that. And there was a lot of demand for it and I enjoyed what I did. Once AI came along and I started seeing that shift, my initial thought process was, I don't think that this uh, technology is really gonna disrupt anything. It just seemed very, I don't know, generic. Like you'd see an article come out, you'd see a video come out and it was, just not on par what I thought, what I felt uh, I could produce. And then something shifted where I started to see, uh, you know, GPT 3.5 at the time really start to create content that I believe was on, starting to be on par with what I would expect a human level person to do. I was like, this is going to be a problem. And so I went from a complete AI skeptic to, I need to be in this industry and really understand it because it's imperative to me going forward. It'll disrupt everything that I do. I need to be a part of this and you see what I can do to best leverage it for myself. Um, at that point in time, uh, Justin McGill, the founder of Continent Scale, approached me and we had a conversation about joining. I was still a little skeptical. And then once I got on board, I just dove straight in and uh, learned as much as I could about AI systems, about prompting, about LLM stacks and how they'd work. And that's brings us up to today where I'm now the director of AI Continent Scale. 
And I spend most of my time prompting AIs and looking for ways to use AI inside of content and how to do uh, the best content marketing possible. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a fascinating journey that you've been on, Jeff. And I guess it highlights something that I've been watching for the last few months now. So I, many, many years ago, I, I went to university and studied software engineering for my sins and realized that it's absolutely not what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I've got a talent for hacking together code, like good enough that I can do what I want to do, but it's never going to be production quality and you know, all those, it's kind of hobby coding is what I call it. Right. And so I've always had, um, a propensity towards tech and technology and making things work together. And what I see in the marketplace now is you've got hardcore salespeople that refuse to embrace AI. You've got hardcore marketers who refuse to embrace AI and you've got hardcore AI people who don't have a clue about sales or marketing. But then you've got a blend of people in the middle who are leaning into each other's disciplines. And that for me is the, is the honeypot right now is where you've got somebody who has serious technological capabilities and can write really good prompts, but not just write the prompt to understand why the prompts are good and, and understand the principles of behavioral psychology and NLP programming and all of these different aspects have never been important before. And they also understand how to sell to people and they understand how to market to people. And uh, like there are some people making ludicrous amounts of money in that space right now for the right companies where they can leverage that very unique skill set. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, if you're a salesperson or a marketing person or even just a business person, if you jump on that ladder now and put yourself through the pain of learning how to do even just the basics, you can, you know, I, I use AI tons. I use AI tons to do different things. You've got to understand what it's capable of, what it's not capable of, what, what, what you can and can't get away with using it for and why. Um, but I do the equivalent of five people's work as one person. I run two and a half businesses in four day a week and I still have time to enjoy it because I use a ton of AI. Um, what's for you, what are the big pitfalls of people who want to work with AI? Like, what are you seeing people do that just makes you roll your eyes or, like, you know it's just not going to work despite their best efforts, right? Like, what's what's everybody doing right now that's frustrating you? Yeah, I think that patience is a, is a huge one. This is a new technology, and even though it's been around for, like, a decade plus, like, we, we've had instances of, like, minor AI for a long time but the thing is is that uh it still is a new technology and you have to be patient with it you have to learn the aspects of of how to communicate with this system to actually get the desired result that you want uh we have a term in the industry which is garbage in garbage out if you give bad input to the ai it's going to give you bad output and so really understanding that that is like the core principle that you need to understand is if I give really good information, I know how to prompt this well, I will get a good result out of the AI. So if you've ever tried AI in the past, if you've pulled up a JGPT and you said, uh, how do I bake bread? And you got like a generic output that didn't really help you. Maybe you wanted to like spice it up with some, I don't know, chocolate chip or something, right? Um, then you would need to give it more context and more details for it to give you a really good recipe. And that translates to everything that you do, even for your marketing. So say if you're like creating social posts, well, you should probably be pulling in context from your previous social posts and feeding that to a system like ChatGPT and saying, this is what I've written in the past. These are some of the themes that I kind of tackle. This is how I write. This is my style. I need you to analyze all of this information that I have for you. And then I need you to then think about that information and then output it for me. And the key thing there is that think, like, I want you to take a step back. It's not going to actually take a step back, but it's going to break down the, what you gave it, gave it in steps. And once it starts to do that and understand the contextual elements in steps, it can really start to give you really good outputs. And so that is by far the most frustrating thing for me is just seeing that people will grab this technology and get their hands on it and be like, wow, there's a lot of hype around this. Let me dive in, but then not have the patience to kind of just understand that it is a new technology and let's uh, approach it from a place of like, let's play with this thing and see what it really can do. I, I, I see that. And. I think it's it's interesting. There's that 
again, it comes back to the behavioral science psychology aspect of things, right? Because you're talking to it like it's another human being and it's very normal language. There's no kind of technical jargon needed. Um, I think a lot of people falsely assume certain things about it. Like, like if I'm giving it the information, it's a computer and I'm telling it all about this information. If I gave all of this to another human being, they would read all of this and understand it. And yet with, with the AI, there's that other step to go, right, I've given you the information. Here's what I want you to do with it before we get to the point where we're going to output anything new. And I think it's just kind of, as, as, as an end user, kind of getting your head around the fact that it's a, a computer that you talk to like a human. Like it's, it's a very weird situation to be in. But I agree, once you get your head around the fact that it doesn't work like a human because it's not a human, then, you know, I, I, I get frustrated with it sometimes and I'll shout at it, you know, like, why won't you follow the word count that I gave you? Like, how many words was that? 750. Right. How many word counts did I tell you to do? A thousand. Why is it not a thousand? Oh, I've done it wrong. I'm very sorry. Well, you're an idiot. And, and it'll come to people, well, you know, I'm just saying, like, don't, don't shout at me. I'm like, oh, I feel bad now. Um, one day it would be my yeah. overlord, right? Right, right. I mean, I mean, hopefully not. Hopefully we have a good symbiotic relationship, but I, you know, there is the, the doomsday people out there. They're kind of like, hey, the AI is going to take over the world. And I mean, we have like a 10% chance. Either way, I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure if we rewind back 100 years, people were saying the same things about, you know, steam engines and cars. And, you know, it's like people aren't going to need to do X, Y, and Z. And it creates a whole new industry around creating it in the first place. And people just chop and change their job roles and, and adapt to what it is that's coming. So like I always say to people who are about their job and like, well, if all you ever do is the very basics and you're just repeating the process day in, day out, you're not putting anything human into it. Yeah. AI is going to replace your job 100% because why wouldn't it? You're not adding anything human into your job, but if you do your job and you go that extra mile, maybe it's customer service and, and you think outside the box, you don't follow the procedures sometimes because sometimes the situation dictates that you break the rules, like computers are not really going to ever break the rules, you know, and eventually, like ultimately somebody needs to observe the AI's outputs and inputs and make sure it's doing what we've asked it to do in the way that we'd expect it to do. So it creates a whole new industry around optimizing the AI. And for me, would I rather be sitting at the front end doing a repetitive, monotonous task over and over again? Or would I rather be analyzing outputs to see whether it's doing what it's supposed to be doing? Well, I think the analyzing the outputs is probably more fun than just repeating over and over again, right? Yeah. One thing that I want to say, too, is that people, people look at AI as like if it's permission for you to take your foot off the gas pedal. And what I mean by that is that they look at it like I can do all these like mundane tasks, like the AI can do that for me. But just because it's doing those tasks doesn't mean that as a marketer, as a business owner, that you should be lit up, that you should, you know, that, oh, AI is going to do everything for me. No, it's not enable you to focus on those higher level tasks that you should be doing anyways, that maybe you just don't have the resources for. And so when you come at it from that perspective and you're like, this is going to enable me to maybe to give 10% more gas in my business to then approach like the customer service side that's where you go and like you go that extra mile for them you you send them maybe a postcard in the mail that you like, remembered their birthday or something like that but there's so many aspects to it to where you can actually up skill and up level your own business and this is like the majority of what i talk about here in like 2024 this year this entire year is for me is talking to people about upskilling in which there's so many ways that you can upskill and one of them is just playing with ai and getting your hands on it having that patience and then putting your gas back on the pedal even harder once you've gotten those automations and systems down to then expand the rest of your business. Focus on the things that really matter and actually create leverage for you. Yeah, 100%. That's, that's when I preach. Like, I didn't bring AI into Javelin content to make my life easy. I brought it in so that I could save myself employing five people to do the job that I can do on my own, more or less, where we're at breaking point now, right? So I'm having to bring other people in still, but each of those people will be shown how to use the AI to make their life easier. So I bring in one person instead of another five. All of a sudden, we've got a 10-man team. We've got two people doing it. Like, 
that's beautiful and it's more profitable and it's more exciting and it's more fun. And to your point, I get to spend time doing the things that I enjoy doing, not not the stuff that doesn't excite me or entertain me or it's high volume stuff and it's just repetitive over and over again. It's like you've got that's, that's what AI is really, really good at doing. I guess one of the one of the questions that's out there at the moment, I've seen a few businesses out there, and I know you guys aren't about this, but I've seen a couple of businesses out there where they will do things like um, look at the SEO content of a competitor's website and then mass produce huge amounts of content to compete with their organic traffic and remove the footfall, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously the advent of the new Google um, anti-AI platform that's that's coming out to detect AI posts and content. Where do you see the future of AI going with all of this? Because there's balance. Like, how do we police particularly the right way for marketing to be done? I know you guys aren't aren't about. I know it's content at scale, but it's it's done responsibly. I like the way you guys talk about it when we when we've discussed the product. What's your thoughts on where the industry is going as a whole on that? Yeah, that's a that's a tough one. There's going to be a lot of pain before there's a a accurate and good solution. I think that. While AI detection is currently out and we have it, and we have the ability to detect AI content is not a perfect science. Um, and that's where we get things like we have AI detectors uh, showing the, like the, the declaration of independence as being AI generated. Gener generated. We have um, students that may have written you know their papers by hand and it's showing up as AI generated. And we're going to consistently see that and it's going to be a cat and mouse game with AI generated content and AI detection kind of matching that. Um, we will see bad actors in SEO. It's going to happen. It's already happening to where, just like you said, we have somebody that maybe wants to try to steal traffic from a competitor. And so they're literally just take, ingesting the site map and saying, I want to generate all of these articles. But here's the thing about most AI tools. This it goes back to the, the one of the very first things I said, which is garbage in, garbage out. So when you take a sitemap and you said, I just want to mass produce all of these articles. Well, the thing that you're losing there is you're losing the EEAT from Google. So you're using that, losing the expertise, you're losing the authority, you're losing the trust and all the things that make a really good article good and, and, and beneficial to the reader. And so, yes, an AI tool can mass produce AI content, but it shouldn't just stop there. This is one of those moments where you have an output from an AI, hit that gas pedal even harder, go inside of that article, add some additional thoughts to it, make that content piece even better and satisfy the search intent of that actual keyword. And if you can do that, even within just an hour of your time, you're creating a awesome piece of content that's, that Google's going to love and you're not going to get uh, slapped by Google, just like many people did in this past March update. If you create a AI content and it's straight out of ChatGPT, you just posted it on your site. You're in a bad spot right now because what you did is you just took a garbage output from an AI and just thought, I can just throw this up on my site with minimal stuff done to it. It's like, no, you still need to be a marketer. You still need, AI is here, but AI needs you. If you're listening to this, AI needs you to take its hand and give it that extra flair to then you're basically just leveling up your content. So use that and leverage the AI system, but don't lose the human factor from it. Put your foot on the gas pedal, go harder into that content, make sure you give an awesome piece and try to win every single person with each piece of content that you produce. I love that phrase, I need you. I just have a picture of like the um, the old Uncle Bob, um, American you know, conscription advert point, point on the camera, like AI needs you. It's It's totally true. <laughs> It's totally true. And I think uh, I, I, I'll talk to a lot of people. I'm a big advocate for AI where it's suitable to use it. And I'll come across a lot of people trying to use it for things it's just not good at right now. Maybe never will be. But I also come across, like you say, a lot of people who just want to fast track their laziness and get to the end result without any output from them. And it's so to what we said earlier about, you know, if you, if your job is literally to take one input and create another output without any, you're going to get replaced. And for me, it's like, like AI can create the start point. It can get you 80% of the way there and you've got to do the last 20%. But 
or it can, you can do the first 20% and it'll get you the other 80%. But either way, it's got to have that mix in there. Of the, the two, like the combination of the two, it locks you. I think you called it symbiotic, right? Like it's, it is, it's got to be that mm. connection of the two that makes it greater than either of the, like I don't have the skills to write a long form blog. I'm not a copywriter. I would love AI to write me one all of its own accord and it reflect my memory and my experiences and opinions, but it doesn't have my memory experiences and opinions. So if all I've got to do when I get to a blog is go, right, here's my experience of this, here's my viewpoint on this, and here's how this has impacted on me, and add those into the blog. That blog can have sings and dances if we've done our job with the AI. And that's that's kind of like I love that's where you guys have gone with your input. Like I, I when we when we talked about and this isn't this isn't a promo for you guys by any way, but like when we talked about the platform, I love the, the the responsible way in which you guys deliver that over to the end client. Is it's this isn't the magic answer, this isn't the magic solution, but we take a lot of the work out of it for you and it's best in class. And I love that. I love that. What's what's next for you guys? What's what's in your what's on your horizon for this year? Because you you've undoubtedly got some big things coming. Right. So We've, <laughs> it, first off, if you don't know much about content at scale, we're an all-in-one SEO writing tool. That's the main thing that we do. It's our bread and butter. We have other AI tools associated with uh, content at scale, the generative AI, but really our bread and butter, everybody from the leadership team is uh, head down in SEO. We all come from an SEO background. Many of us had SEO agencies in the past, so we really get it. We're not a marketing team creating an SEO product. We are an SEOs creating an AI product. So uh, something on the horizon is that while it's really good to get content out of AI that is undetectable and all this stuff, we really want to go deep into that human experience. So our belief is in the future, uh, the way that you'll be relevant when in the age of AI where it's doing everything for us is still that human experience. So everything that you know and the things that you feel and see and touch and those experiences and how you can translate that to the AI. So our very next thing is something called brand ingestion. Uh, it's going to be a little ways out where we're actually intaking everything from your brand and we're then understanding all the content that you've written. We're creating, creating databases on it. We're creating databases on your social posts and everything that you do, then understand you completely. And once we get that level of understanding, we can then use that for the output. We want to get to 100% straight out AI where it has all that information. But the thing is, is that you're not completely out of the picture then. Just because we can do that, you can go straight out AI. We still need you. We still need you to then feed that information with additional context so that way we can create really awesome content that is still relevant to you. Because maybe you had a, a baby, you know, three months ago. The AI is not going to know that unless you're there to provide that information to it. So that's kind of where we're headed. And that's like our, our goal. It's probably me sharing a little bit too much because um, <laughs> I don't think we've talked about that publicly. But I think that uh, that that is the direction that we want to go into. And uh, recently, we really also released something called Deep Research, which is We've uh, done a, typically like most AI tools, especially us as a, as a platform before, is that we would just call, crawl Google. That's what we do. We'd crawl Google and kind of like understand what the couple top ranking articles is are. Or maybe you just if you use ChatGPT in the past, you've all you've done is just hey, write me a one thousand word blog post. And so we went we went a step deeper, in which we started ingesting everything we possibly could. We're talking about scholarly articles, uh, tweets from Twitter, Reddit posts. Um, top news trending stories, uh, the Google rankings, and we just all these different sources to then create a custom database of that information to then write blog posts. So, for instance, an article that I ran during while we we're creating deep research was uh, the day of the release of Dune, Dune Two. I wanted to know what the box office numbers were that day. There wasn't a ton of content out there. And if you're an AI model, if you're using ChatGPT, it's not going to know without browsing the web. So what we did is we we looked at Dune 2 and said, hey, let's create an article around this. And it got the exact box numbers figures right. Plus it had quotes from moviegoers going to see it and what they loved about it and how that contributed to the, the success of the box office numbers the, from the day that it was released. We're not talking about a few days later, that exact day, because it was, it was crawling these like top news stories and taking all the information in. So that's kind of what we've been working on behind the scenes. I think that's, that's incredibly exciting. If we kind of rewind back um, a little bit, I think 
I think what we're going to see in the not too distant future, and it sounds like you guys are heading that way anyways, you know, AI won't be something that we talk to only when we want to get work done, but it will kind of become, you know, you'll have a sit down on a morning for half an hour and you'll talk to chat GPT or whichever model or AI you're talking to and tell it about how your day was yesterday. Here's what we did and here's how I felt about it and, and X, Y, and Z. And it will be stored locally and securely and, you know, privacy will be all happy about everything. But fundamentally, the AI is going to really understand everything that's going on in our world and what, what we want it to know about us. And it might even ask us questions and it'll become a, like a, just another employee in the business, right? Somebody you talk to and, and open up about. And I think I can see that sort of level of research and understanding really sitting side by side with that and delivering something that everybody can work with and interact with and get some real value from. Um, it's going to be interesting. Like 2024, like 2023 was the year of AI. There's no doubt about it. 2024 is about how we put that AI into practice. Um, how, you know, I still speak to people in my personal life who have no idea about ChatGPT and AI and, and BARD and, and all the other uh, LLMs that are out there. Like, you know, this whole industries that just have no idea this stuff's coming um i showed you know i showed a business partner of mine how i interacted with a, a gpt model that i built it was an expert in the mining industry and because that's that's where he's doing a lot of work and and, and i was you know he was asking questions about um, cost for exploration of a site and, and blah 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 and I fed it with some information and asked it to come up with some anticipated costs for how much that would cost to do based on a couple of factors. And the answer was super specific, way beyond either of our knowledge. And it just blew his mind. And I just think there are so many industries out there that have yet to experience the full impact of what's possible with this. Um, great, to, great to hear from you guys where you guys are taking that and, and kind of at the forefront of what's next. If the listeners to the show are, uh, are enjoying the content. Like, how can they? How can they hear more from you, Jeff? Like, where can they contact you? Where's Where's your podcast hosted? Right. So our podcast is hosted on every single platform. It's called Humanity Unchained. Uh, what we really focus on on there is upskilling and talking about these really deep conversations around AI that nobody really talks about. Most AI conversations are just surface level. It's like, oh, I use ChatGPT and that was cool, or maybe it was like just just AI news. We want to go deeper. Like our Robots going to become sentient. Like, what does that mean? And what does AGI mean for you in the future? Like, those are the topics we kind of want to cover with that. Uh, but if you want to reach out to me directly, uh, you can contact me at Jeff at contentscale.ai. I always answer emails that I get. Um, my preferred way of communication is LinkedIn. Uh, if you LinkedIn, Jeff Joyce, that you should be able to find me. I'm wearing a brown coat. <laughs> um, and then lastly is content at scale, contentscale.ai. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Perfect. I'll make sure all of those are in the uh, in the show notes when we uh, polish the episode up. Uh, Jeff, thanks very much for joining us today. It was very interesting chat. Not not at all where I expect some of the conversation to go. So really nicely surprising. And uh, I hope if you're listening, awesome. you've enjoyed along, learned something from it. Maybe you've got some questions. Feel free to reach out, and we'll see you again next week for another episode of Market Pulse Pros and Pioneers. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to feature on a future show or you've got some ideas for folks who would make a great guest, please drop us a line. The contact details are in the show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Your host today was Paul Banks, founder at Javelin Content Management. Javelin specialize in helping busy business owners just like you to repurpose video content, taking all the stress and tech problems away, and turning your long-form video into literally hundreds of pieces of content without breaking the bank. If you want to launch your personal brand, become the vendor of choice for your audience, or maximize your sales revenue impact, we'd love to hear from you. Join us next week for the next episode, and don't forget to give us a subscribe and a review. Our podcast is only possible with your support.